Welcome to the Right Voices interview series. I'm John Hart, the co-founder of C3 Solutions, along with Drew Bond, who is here co-hosting today. And today we're thrilled to be joined by Nick Loris at the Heritage Foundation. Nick is here to talk about a new paper that we commissioned at three, three, C3 Solutions called Free Economies or Clean Economies. You can follow us at c3solutions.org and also our news magazine is c3newsmagazine.com. And on the news magazine, we have a feature called Right Voices. And what that is, is a, is a place where we highlight and feature conservative policymakers and thought leaders who are offering solutions in the climate and environment space. And just a bit more about our, our organization before we start is where the, the long title is Conservative Coalition for Climate Solutions. And uh, Drew, Drew Bond and I've known each other for 20 years. Uh, Drew was a staffer for Don Nichols. Uh, I work for Tom Coburn for most of my time on Capitol Hill. And to make a very long story short, is a couple of years ago, I bought a farm. So I live uh, near uh, Harper's Ferry. So I've got 62 acres in Maryland. And Drew, I knew uh, from the Hill, but he also has a solar company. So I brought Drew out to talk about putting solar on my sustainable farm. And we had this chuckle about, you know, these two right wingers doing sustainable farming and solar. We thought, gosh, if our, if our friends on the left could just see what we're up to. So we, so that, that kind of laughter and that chuckle turned into an epiphany. So we, realize that there is a need in the space for more conservatives to jump in and talk about what we're for. And so our mission is to protect America's natural and economic environment. And we believe that by talking about these issues, climate the, and, and the environment, we're not seeding ground, we're actually seizing the high ground. So with that spirit in mind, I want to welcome Nick. Uh, Nick uh, is just really one of the most talented voices and thinkers in the space. Uh, we're really honored to have his help uh, writing this paper. And uh, Nick, let me just kick it kick it to you and just tell me what do you see as some of the key the key takeaways? I think one thing that jumped out to me is that uh, you looked at uh, economies all over the world. I think 180 different countries, and uh, the data to me looks like free economies tend to be twice as clean as less free. So so maybe walk us through what you see as the key conclusions and and what you think people should take away from the report. Yeah, and it really dates back to when I first found out about the Index of Economic Freedom at the Heritage Foundation as an undergrad, and, and I just thought it's such a good objective measurement of the importance of economic freedom to human flourishing, uh, to people's health, to people's livelihoods, to uh, improving uh, mortality rates uh, and the like, and, and the same holds true for the environment, and I think it often goes overlooked uh, and, and folks say that free markets and capitalism are destroying the planet when in fact uh, they're largely responsible for improving it. And so the, the institutions uh, matter uh, for sure in, in terms of making sure uh, that private property rights are accounted for, uh, that tax rates are low. Uh, and when you have these uh, principles in place that measure economic freedom, uh, it, it really harnesses the opportunities to uh, not only grow people's economies and raise standards of living, but also care for the environment. Uh, more resources are available uh, for environmental protection, uh, but it also encourages investments in new cleaner technologies too. So overall, uh, if you look at the strong correlation between those countries that are economically free or mostly free uh, and their environmental performance standards and, and what we did in this report was really look at the index of economic freedom and Yale's environmental performance index that they've been putting out for a few years now. And, and it's a really great objective analysis as to uh, all of the environmental metrics uh, that countries have um, in terms of air quality, water quality, greenhouse gas emissions. And so uh, there's a lot of good data sets out there to, to measure what this correlation looks like. And I think it, it provides a good glimpse into uh, what we can do to continue to make strides in improving the environment, both in the in the developed and the developing world. Yeah, so Nick, um, I really just love the report. Uh, thanks so much for your authorship. And uh, I've always been a big fan of the Index of Economic Freedom, dating back to my time at Heritage, as you know. Um, you know, one of the potential wrong takeaways from this, uh, I think maybe from the left, would be that what you're saying is that uh, economic freedom is just a magic solution. Uh, we don't need to do anything to, re to reduce our carbon emissions. We don't need to do anything to improve our environment. We just need to embrace more economic freedom and everything will get cleaner. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Not at all. It's a great question. And, and 
economic freedom can certainly lead the way and the pace of innovation and the private sector can lead the way, but uh, governments play a critical role too. Um, one, in terms of holding polluters accountable. Uh, you know, we, we certainly need laws and regulations uh, and we can have discussions about where those laws and regulations should be, whether it's at the federal level or at the state and local level, level uh, or the international level, depending on you know, what environmental challenge we're talking about. You know, there are roles for laws and regulations to make sure that polluters are, are not degrading our air quality or degrading our water quality or really any other environmental challenge that we face. Uh, at the same time, the, the federal government is important and, and state governments are important for enforcing the rules of the game. Uh, it, it's really those countries with uh, strong rules of law uh, and the ones that can actually enforce private property rights, which is fundamental to conservation uh, and, and good environmental stewardship uh, to uh, leading to better environmental outcomes. So uh, where countries are least free, uh, you know, the, the law, rule of law is very poor there. Uh, and uh, so it's really focusing on what is that right role for the federal government and what is that right role for, for government speaking broadly uh, but it's it's making sure that also the federal government doesn't trample on the private sector and uh, individuals' inability to innovate and conserve on their own. Yes. Yeah, Nick, if I if I could follow up on that, is can you give us a couple of examples from the paper of where private property rights worked well and and where not respecting prop property rights did not work? Maybe maybe not to not to lead you in the in the Venezuela direction, but that certainly. That's certainly one that stands out where there was, yeah. point, but, hmm. but, um, but, but talk through that because I think it's a, a fundamental point um, to this, to your paper. Yeah, it really is. And, and, and the kind of old economist adage is that nobody washes a rental car because you don't take care of uh, what you own. And, and if you look at, you know, places like the United States uh, where there are strong private property rights, uh, this is where you see uh, some of the, better um, types of environmental stewardship. Uh, and uh, that's not true um, just uh, in the United States, but elsewhere around the world. But if you, if you juxtapose that with places like uh, Brazil, which has had struggles um, in the rainforest with poor private property rights and poor uh, rule of law, uh, you've seen opportunities for countries to kind of uh, make up claims uh, about ownership of parts of the rainforest and then uh, clear it out for their own personal purposes. And, and you know, we don't have those problems as much in the United States. Uh, and, and if you look at private land ownership in the United States, uh, it's a really good example where there's a lot of economic progress at the, and at the same time, uh, environmental protection, because people understand that uh, land use can be a, a valuable asset uh, when managed properly, whether it's for energy extraction, uh, whether it's for renewable energy development, uh, whether it's for farming and grazing, uh, but they also don't want to pollute their own backyard because that's going to reduce uh, the uh, value of that asset. So there's there's really good examples kind of on a micro level, but on, also on a macro level where the, the countries that don't have those strong private property rights, uh, there's a there's an incentive to kind of take over that land for their own personal purposes and, and clear cut away, leading to deforestation, things like that. Or there's tragedy of commons problems uh, where people are going to exploit those resources as quickly as possible without any regard for future conservation, uh, because if they don't do it, someone else will. Right. Yeah, I, I just think that's such a critical point. And uh, one of the things that you highlighted in the property rights uh, area was this um, issue around um, the mineral rights, subsurface mineral rights, right? And and so often in the discussion around natural gas and 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 fracking, uh, we talk about the need for innovation. We talk about the important role that the Department of Energy played in that, uh, and and that entrepreneurs like George Mitchell, you know, played in taking risk. But it's not often that you hear, um, you know, the point that you make about having. Um, having subsurface mineral rights be so critical for, you know, incentivizing, giving somebody that ownership incentive. So, uh, yeah, I think that was just a, just a point that I want to underscore. 
Yeah, yeah, it's a great example where you know you've seen increased energy production, lower greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it's saving consumers money, and if you again juxtapose that with a a Venezuela or a China and some of these state-owned enterprises where they uh, they aren't necessarily rewarded by the same profit incentive that exists out there or the stewardship incentives that exist uh, with respect to private property rights. You see a lot of those state-owned enterprises flailing. You've seen land seizorships in, in places like uh, China. And so uh, there's great examples, uh, again, with some of the lowest quality uh, countries in terms of economic freedom, uh, where they've just completely disregarded private property rights. Drew, explain a little bit who George Mitchell is. If we're not talking about the former senator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah good Mitchell. clarification. So George Mitchell, uh, and who actually, uh, they now have the, the Mitchell Foundation in Texas in honor of, of him, uh, was a was a, a you know a Texas wildcatter, uh, you know oil you know oil rigger guy that uh, had a vision for uh, digging deeper wells and going to kind of new frontiers below the surface that didn't you know before that really uh, no one had thought of. So uh, he was an entrepreneur. He was a risk taker. Um, he was largely credited with uh, you know being the guy that uh, was willing to stick his neck out there. And uh, and what resulted in this natural gas, you know, fracking revolution, and really discovering, uh, you know, discovering these these low, you know, deep uh, mineral resources that that uh, before that nobody had really, you know, thought we would get to or thought they would be economical. And, and Nick, what's your view? Did did the natural gas fracking revolution help or hurt the planet? Yeah, that, that is a very loaded question. It, it helps the planet, uh, you know, not just in terms of reducing emissions. And we've seen uh, energy related CO2 emissions drop uh, since the fracking revolution. And as and we've also seen increased renewable deployment in the United States. So that's certainly helped as well. But the, the primary reason has been because of the uh, natural gas revolution that we're seeing here in the United States. Uh, so in terms of economic benefits and environmental benefits, uh, it, it's been a win-win for the US. And at the same time, we're also helping people reduce their environmental footprint uh, abroad because we're now exporting liquefied natural gas and the Department of Energy's uh, National Energy Technology Laboratory modeled kind of different scenarios as to what will happen with US LNG exports. And if it displaces Russian piped gas, which is dirty, or displaces coal use, uh, we're also helping people reduce their environmental footprint overseas. Yeah, and Nick, one thing I think it'd be, it'd be useful to talk through as well is the, is the evolution that economies go through, where they start by producing, burning perhaps a lot of coal, but it's through the burning of some fossil fuels that they develop the wealth they need to develop cleaner technologies. And so, so I think there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a well-intentioned among some people uh, effort to not burn any fossil fuels because you know, I think you know, we would agree, at least Drew and I, that, that CO2 is, is adverse, that we don't wanna put more CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, but that uh, if we have, it, it's backing up, I'd say there's a tension between the all of the above energy strategy and an everything but. I think Drew, Drew articulates as well, but we want in everything and all of the above where we're embracing all technologies. We don't, the government doesn't pick winners and losers, but if we have an everything but approach, everything but coal, everything but nuclear, everything but what a particular political movement says is inappropriate energy, then we actually make it worse for poor people. We make it harder for innovators to develop the breakthroughs and technologies that we need to develop clean energy. So maybe you could talk about how, what your, your view on that and how, what your paper says about it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and I think it, it speaks to kind of the anti-growth movement that has percolated and, and maybe has always been around really and, and kind of concerns about growth, whether it's been population growth or, um, you know, concerns about running out of food. Uh, you know, there's always been this concern that too much growth is going to be bad. Uh, and growth helps uh, people, you know, come out of poverty, but it also can help people protect their environment. And so uh, a key to protecting the environment is that growth model uh, that, you know, there's the, what's known as the environmental Kuznets curve, which is a, 
an inverted U um, that shows uh, environmental degradation on the vertical axis and uh, GDP or GDP per capita, however you, you want to measure economic growth on the horizontal axis. And, and yes, as countries grow and, and you know, start to industrialize a little bit more, there, there's going to be some pollution. Uh, and uh, at the same time, once countries kind of reach some sort of income threshold level, uh, they have more resources to protect against that pollution, or there's more of an incentive to uh, implement regulations to protect uh, against some of those harmful emissions. And that's important to take into consideration that we don't want to trap people in poverty. Uh, we, we need to make sure that they can grow out of poverty to protect the environment. And certainly, you know, we want to be able to do them hand in hand. Uh, you know, they are not mutually exclusive by any means. And the more we can help uh, countries grow economically while also protecting the environment is ultimately what I think the left and the right should aim to achieve. Yeah, I, I love that point because I mean, you know, we hear so much here in the United States about what we need to do to reduce our own carbon emissions. Um, but, you know, as you know, I mean, carbon is a, a global issue. Climate change is a global issue. And so uh, even if we reduced our you know, carbon emissions to almost nothing, um, you know, there's still, you know, 90 percent of the world that's left uh, in terms of overall carbon uh, to figure out what to do with. And so, I mean, one of the things that came out um, after reading your report in my mind and discussing it with a couple of colleagues is, you know, what if we could actually take the sort of bottom tier countries in the index of economic freedom and simply move them up, you know, several rungs of the ladder? Like what impact would that have from a carbon emission standpoint? It certainly would help them, you know, economically. And, uh, and if we did it through free market, you know, conservative principles that you articulate in terms of rule of law, you know, um, you know, limited government, uh, you know, efficient and lower taxes. I mean, um, you know, wouldn't it be a win-win for the environment and and the world? Yeah, absolutely. And some of the, you know, these state-owned enterprises, particularly China, I mean, they're rapidly expanding their coal use and their industrialization uh, without regard for the environment. And you know, the, the amount of coal that they have planned or in deployment is about six times as much as the entire use, uh, coal use of the country of Germany. Uh, and uh, part of the problem there is not necessarily the, the use of coal, uh, but the fact is that you know, we have scrubbers on our coal-fired power plants here in the United States, and they just, they just don't have them or they don't you turn them on uh, because they want to burn as cheaply as possible. And so that technology already exists in terms of reducing the SOX and NOx and the other criterion pollutants. Uh, but when you have this kind of driven state-owned enterprise and, and this industrial policy driven by a, a central, more statist government, those are the environmental outcomes you're, you're going to see. That's good. Yeah, maybe I, if I could ask a question about tax policy, Nick, because there's a lot of discussion uh, on Capitol Hill these days about uh, increasing the corporate tax rate. There's also a lot of discussion around additional tax incentives. Um, you know, you talk about this a little bit in the paper, but can you, you know, help us understand, you know, what is from your perspective, sort of the, you know, a, a destructive form of policy uh, that's actually not good for the environment as opposed to a constructive form of policy from a tax perspective? Yeah, and, and it's really taken over storm, I would say, over the past kind of 20 years or so is using the tax code to pick winners and losers among energy sources and technologies, uh, you know, targeted tax credits, I would say, are the, uh, a destructive form of tax policy, both from an economic and an environmental standpoint. Uh, if you look at uh, tax credits to subsidize specific renewable energy sources or electric vehicles, uh, in terms of looking at emissions abatement costs uh, of, you know, dollars uh, per, per ton of CO2 reduced, uh, you're not getting a whole lot of bang for your subsidized buck. Uh, and there's even deeper problems with that is that then technologies may become dependent on this tax subsidies and, and never fully realize the true costs at which they're competitive. Uh, and if there's other more promising emissions-free technologies, they may miss out because the government is directing both uh, taxpayer resources, but then also private capital uh, to these technologies. And so from a, an investment standpoint, I think it's a really destructive way to encourage uh, emissions reductions and to, to clean up our environment. But if we have broader tax policy that encourages more investment, 
uh, you know, what, one thing that Drew and I, I know you and I have talked about a bunch uh, is immediate expensing or 100% bonus depreciation where companies can uh, expense the costs uh, in the year that they're incurred rather than depreciate them over time, which is more kind of a, an, a boon for uh, accountants, not for investors. Uh, that actually encourages new investment from everything from, you know, new HVAC systems to new energy technologies. And the more we can extend that to asset classes uh, longer than 20 years, because right now the provision is for shorter term asset classes. So if we can do it for things like buildings and research and development centers, that's a, a good pro-growth uh, economic policy, tax policy, that will also help investment in new, more energy efficient technologies, which is why a lot of kind of the energy efficiency trade groups are all pro-expensing because they understand that it'll help incentivize that efficiency. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a, such a good point. And I, I recall from your writing that, you know, it was actually the Tax Foundation that um, one of, maybe first made this point. But, uh, you know, I know even from my uh, my other, you know, business perspective. John mentioned I have a solar company, which is is not usually a conservative thing to do. But, uh, but you know, we got into it because we have a product that you know reduces the cost of solar, so it, it should make it, uh, you know, affordable without subsidies. And and I've seen firsthand, experienced firsthand, the the challenges of trying to navigate the tax code uh, on you know the investment tax credit for for solar. Uh, and and then if you look historically at at the the wind production tax credit, I mean the the, the growth of wind here in the United States uh, e either accelerates or decelerates based on if the tax credit is going to be around. And so you know it's interesting to me that this expensing provision sort of feels like inside baseball sometimes, um, but it has such a dramatic impact across so many industries that I'm really glad that you pointed out. Yeah, it really does. And, it, and it's interesting because, you know, the president's American jobs plan has calls for increased energy efficiency in buildings and weatherization programs. And those things on their face sound very good. You know, we want people to uh, save money by increasing efficiency, uh, whether it's that's in buildings or vehicles or manufacturing processes. But there's a, a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And a lot of times the subsidies the upfront cost because they've been subsidized uh, in terms of taxpayer expenses hasn't actually materialized in terms of energy efficiency savings. And these policies can sometimes be a, li a little more destructive when you're using subsidies to try to get there. Nick, since we have you, to tell us about, you're, you've done a deep dive on the Green New Deal. Do you see that Give us your take on the Green New Deal and, and what you see as the future of that, uh, of that policy. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, policy. Many aspects of it are kind of the opposite of the approach that I think the three of us would like to see, uh, and that it's a kind of a large focus on subsidies and mandates and regulations to achieve a desired outcome and, and then on specific technologies too. Uh, so it's very uh, prescriptive and not focused on outcomes. Uh, at least the initial kind of resolution as well as the frequently asked questions when that came out and they were like no we're not going to use nuclear uh and um, we're only going to go wind solar and battery uh, which has been shown by studies at mit and elsewhere that that would increase the cost of any emissions emissions reduction targets uh substantially uh and so i think that the the three fundamental flaws uh, with the Green New Deal uh, are one, that it's not really outcome based, it's very prescriptive. Uh, two, that the, the extreme cost um, in terms of higher taxpayer uh, resources deployed to specific technologies, but also to consumers uh, would be substantial uh, and, and very regressive as well, because it's, uh, it's low income consumers who spend a higher percentage of their budget on energy costs and when you try to wipe away 80% of how our energy is derived in a very fast fashion through mandates that these generations, it's going to come at extreme cost uh, and for negligible environmental benefits as well. Um, you know, if you look at just unilateral reductions and Secretary Kerry made this point just yesterday saying, if the US and China reduces their emissions down to zero, it's not going to really be all that meaningful in terms of 
abated warming or abated sea level rise. So I see it as really all economic pain and no environmental gain. Uh, and then third, I think there's all of the unintended consequences that come from these mandates and regulations in that uh, take something like banning uh, oil and gas uh, production in the United States, which President Biden has done on federal lands. Uh, that's not necessarily going to stop the consumption of these resources. It's merely going to shift production overseas. So you're going to see a lot of uh, emissions leakage and pollution leakage. And so in terms of all of the environmental unintended consequences of such a policy, uh, that also negates some of the environmental benefits that the Green New, Green New Deal purports to achieve. Yeah, it's well, Go ahead, Drew. I was just going to say on the, you know, on the Green New Deal. I mean, I've heard it, uh, heard it here in Washington. I don't know if folks, you know, outside of Washington really uh, have time to pay attention to these issues as much. But, you know, even if you wanted to implement the new Green Deal, you know, even if you thought that was a good idea, which we don't, um, you know, you couldn't actually do it because of all the environmental regulations that are in place. And uh, and so you do touch on this a little bit in the report. That's a great point. And there was even a Wall Street Journal article. Uh, a few weeks ago that talked about new transmission lines to take uh, renewable energy from where it's being uh, produced, which is generally in more remote areas to where it needs to be consumed in, in more uh, urban and, and suburban areas. And uh, there's been a talk about building out new transmission lines and the, the Wall Street Journal article talked and basically said that, you know, this is not a problem of uh, attracting investors uh, or anything like that. It's really just kind of the onerously long environmental review and permitting timeframes. It's the fact that it will get held up in, in years of litigation uh, and just kind of the nimbyism problem that exists for all energy sources and technologies. And I, I remember the Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, this is a while ago now, but had this uh, website called Project No Project. And they talked about all of the projects that were stalled because of these problems and an overwhelming majority of them were renewable energy projects. Yeah, and uh, a point I would make too on the on the, the Green New Deal, uh, Nick, I think you've done a great job sort of breaking down some of the flaws in it, but I think, you know, when conservatives think about this issue broadly, they're hesitant to get involved because they feel like, well, this is lefty language. This is, you know, what, what progressives talk about. And by talking about it, we will somehow be giving them uh, credit or giving them momentum. And I think the opposite is true because the Green New Deal itself is not so much a climate plan or, or, or a good one for the reasons you've just described. It's really a socialist manifesto. It's, it's, a, it's a manifesto that uses the issue of climate to wage a proxy war against capitalism and to advance unrelated socialist goals like Medicare for all, free college, universal basic income. And so, so I often think of the, you know, the movie, uh, what's it, Armageddon, the one with Bruce Willis, <laughs> you know, where the asteroid's headed, headed towards the earth. Well, if there's an asteroid, if there's really an existential crisis, if better or work is right, that the world's gonna end in five years, then shouldn't we just go deal with it? Shouldn't we just go straight to that problem? And instead what the Green New Deal does is let's take a diversion, let's go fly around Saturn, let's go fly around Jupiter and do all these other unrelated things to this quote existential problem. And so, so bringing back to your paper, the answer really is to promote economic freedom. If you really think there's an asteroid headed towards the planet, you know, embrace economic freedom, embrace private property rights, the rule of law. And, and, it's, and it's really dishonest to tell people there's an immediate solution. Uh, but we're much better off embracing the solution that will work than one that will not work. And, and it creates false hope and, um, and will not actually address the, the challenges ahead of us. So anyway, that's my, that's my take on it. So I don't know. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I think um, I it was as uh, AOC's chief of staff, I think said it's, you know, you thought, you know, speaking to reporters was like, hey, you thought this was a, how do we solve climate change type of pro uh, policy? It's a more of a, how do you change the entire economy type of policy? And so right. it kind of speaks to, to what you're talking about there. And, I agree. I think it, one, gives false hope, and then also this kind of crying wolf that we only have 10 years to solve climate change or uh, we're going, you know, towards this uh, existential, you know, climate threat. Uh, that just kind of creates this defeatist and nihilistic attitude about 
uh, the environment and climate that I don't think we need. I, you know, I think that there's a, a lot to be uh, uh, optimistic about in terms of where we're going, where the private sector has been going, where consumers want to go. Uh, and if you have all of that rooted in some of these policies and economic freedom, I think you, you get to see a lot of really cool innovations that, you know, government officials aren't going to cook up in Washington, but, you know, someone in Silicon Valley uh, or, a, you know, a high school student in Michigan is going to be thinking about these things in more creative ways uh, than policymakers in D.C. will. And, and to, so to create that kind of culture of permissionless innovation and human ingenuity is something at the center of economic freedom. And the more we can have that in the U.S. and also export that around the world, you know, the better off we're going to be environmentally. Yeah, I love that idea of, you know, exporting economic freedom and also exporting energy innovation around the world. I mean, we, we in the United States are really positioned to do that well. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I just want to make sure um, before we wrap up, Nick, that I uh, thank the Heritage Foundation for, for their uh, important role in this, in this product, uh, both in the 27 years of, you know, creating and and nurturing the index of economic freedom, which is just an amazing tool, uh, and the and the vision behind it from uh, leaders like Ed Fuller at Heritage, and I want to thank you know you and all your bosses and everyone uh, you know Jack Spencer, folks for being willing to to really weigh into this issue um, with us. So so thank you for all your time and hard work on this. Absolutely, yeah, and I appreciate you guys. I mean uh, C3s. Uh, great policy uh, work that you guys have done in a very short amount of time. Uh, great communication. It's really an, encouraging to see. So um, thank you guys for everything that y'all have been doing so far. You bet. Well, thank you, Nick. So this has been the Right Voices series. And again, we're at c3solutions.org. You can go there and you can read Nick's paper and a whole lot of other content that describes kind of our vision of how you can protect America's natural and economic environment. And also we have a news magazine called c3newsmag.com. And at C3 News Mag is there's a feature called Voices. That's where you can go to this Write Voices uh, a feature and it lists uh, really uh, uh, dozens of conservatives who are articulating solutions in the climate space. So Nick, it's been really a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for your, your work, your vision, uh, your scholarship, and uh, uh, look forward to having another conversation with you uh, in the future. Sounds great, thank you.